today's session is going to be a little bit of a like summary slash overview overview of river play uh, i know i've done it a series in the past where i went over the differences of playing rivers in position as well as out of position today what i'm going to attempt to do is provide a more general framework so that you know combining elements from theory as well as exploitive play as well as practice you guys have a map to help you reach like river decisions uh, a little bit easier so our goal today is to summarize the principles of river play uh, we're going to look at reasons to bet i know this sounds very simplistic but yeah why do we actually bet the river uh, we're going to look at bluffing and bluff catching and how to go about doing those uh, we'll talk about bet sizing theory a little bit. We've done this in the past, but I think it's important to have a reminder before we look at more specific examples and toy games. Uh, we'll look at the effects of position, uh, range contraction, and polarization. So what is exactly a polarized range? What types of ranges do we encounter in poker? And in theory, and what actually happens in the real world? Okay. And we'll also talk about value thresholds, uh, which in layman's terms is uh, how good a hand do I need to bet in this spot? Right? So that's my value threshold. The weakest hand I'm able to bet in any given spot is my value threshold. Finally, we'll also discuss blockers, uh, when they're most and least effective, and how they are used for, blo for bluffing as well as value betting. And love casting. So yeah, why do we bet? Right again, according to Matthew Jenda in his book Applications of No Limit Hold'em, uh, which I mean, if you guys are into books, if you read, if you want to read one poker book, that's a pretty good one to pick because the concepts that are mentioned in there like are still at large apply today, whereas most books get outdated pretty quickly. So there are, according to Jenda, there are two reasons to bet. <laughs> we want to. Make the pot to we bet to make it to make the pot bigger in case we win, and we also bet to prevent our opponent from realizing the equity. So those reasons still apply in the river, but it's a much more pure form. People like confuse having the best hand with having to bet, and having the best hand is not always a good enough reason to bet for value. Having the best hand uh, alone is not enough. Like you need to have the best hand, and you. You usually, at least almost always, need to get cold, need to win more than half the time after getting cold to turn the profit on your bet. Okay, because you can have the best hand against, let's say, in a situation where your opponent has, let's say, 20% nuts in his range uh, that actually tie or beat your best hand, and then 80% nothing that will fall to a bet. And you might have like, 90% medium set hands and 10% nutted hands in your range. In that case, even though you have the best hand 90% of the time, like actually 80% of the time, you really don't want to bet. If you don't want to bet because you're actually not achieving anything. Like you make the pot bigger, but you don't win it. Because whenever you make the pot bigger, your opponent folds nothing and uh, only calls when they have a hand that has you beat. So you need to win more than half the time after getting called to turn a profit on your bet. And the above rule holds true regardless of our bet size. So in order to bet for value, again, remember that we need to win more than half the, half the time after getting called. Okay. However, there are some added notes here. There are some exceptions. There are some things that we should be mentioning. Here's the thing. When you're in position, what you're doing is when you're deciding whether to bet or not, it's basically you're, this, you're comparing the AV of betting to the AV of checking, right? And when you have a hand that has sold down value, checking guarantees that you always get to sold down, so you always realize your equity, you win the pot exactly as often as you're supposed to against your opponent's checking range. But if you do bet, you now have to account for the risk of getting raised by your opponent's polarized range, you know, it's going to raise with some hands that beat your value or tie with your value. And then also uh, some bluffs, right? So when you're betting the river for a non all in sizing, you actually need to get called by worse a little bit more often. If, like 
let's say if like 50, 51 is your threshold, usually it's going to be, you need to get cold more like 55 to 60% of the time, depending on the spot, depending on the SPR, depending on rain advantages, you know, to offset that risk of occasionally losing GV uh, by your opponent playing a polarized check raise strategy and like, forcing you to fold uh, the best hand sometimes. So if you want to like kind of think about this in a very simple manner, like the more capable your opponent is of check raising the river as a bluff, the more careful you should be about reopening the action of the river thinly. So if you're playing against someone who's very capable and is tricky and aggressive and finds the right frequencies and even like uh, puts you in tough spots, what you want to do is, you know, really worry about your value thresholds and be careful about your, with your thin value bets. If you're playing against someone who's not as tricky, doesn't slow play too much, you know, doesn't really bluff raise reverse enough, plays mostly, you know, face-up strategies, then you're usually able to value bet a lot more thinly. And then the other exception, if you will, or not exactly exception, but the other, like, note that you should take on this rule is that, again, when we are uh, deciding if we want to bet, we are comparing the view of checking to the view of betting. When we're in position and we check, we just see the showdown, we get, we realize our equity, the hand is over. If we win, we won. Great. But when we're out of position and we check, we don't realize all of our equity because it's a, checking does not guarantee us the showdown. So what happens then is we will check and we will allow our opponent to bet. So we will effectively turn our marginal hands, but like are close between checking and value betting, will turn them into bluff catchers. Because again, our opponent will not bet worse for us, worse for value usually. Uh, but at the same time, like they may bluff us. And if they're bluffing correctly, they will like bluff the right frequency. So we will have a zero or near zero V decision with the bluff cutters, right? So when we're out of position, what we can do is we're allowed to bet a little bit uh, thinner for value. And usually we can use smaller bets as well, like block bets, like you know, 25%, 30% half-pot bets that effectively also set the price for showdown. So even if our hand wins slightly less than half the time when cold, we're still okay with doing that. Okay. So in position, you need to have a better hand to better value. Uh, usually, and against tricky opponent, you have to be careful. Out of position, block betting with hands that are not necessarily getting cold by worse more than half the time, uh, there is there's still valuable. It still adds a bit to your strategy because checking does not guarantee showdown. We'll talk about the types of ranges that exist or rather that we identify in poker. So there's a linear range. So a linear range is a range that is a consisting of strong, medium, as well as relatively big hands. So a linear range is uh, basically a range that is like you pick a certain like portion of your like of the best hands that you have and you continue with those. So you start from preflop, like a linear three betting range is let's say you have a linear 10% three bet. A linear 10% three betting range is take the best 10% of hands and three bet with those. Right. Uh, a linear, let's say, range that calls a five bet, calls a sub is you know, whatever hands, you know, you format and then you're profitable, uh, profitable calls. Like you just call the best ones, fold the worst ones. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, post loop, you can think about linear ranges in sports where like, it's very difficult for you to have the nuts as well as bluffs. So a very good example is if you take a flop, like, you know, like a, like a nice high flop where your opponent bets big on the flop and you call as the defender, uh, what's going to happen is it will be very difficult for you to actually have nothing. It will be very difficult for you to have the nuts, uh, but it will also be very difficult for you to have nothing. So you're, main, you're mainly going to have like strong, medium, and some weak hand, like in you know, a second pair, top pair with kicker, uh, like some king high draws, like whatever, like that sort of thing. But, you know, the action dictates that, you know, you don't really have 
no equity hands show. That's the idea. A polarized range is a range that is like the opposite of linear, so it only contains very strong hands, strong hands and nutted hands, hands that are both multiple street value beds as well as weak hands. Okay. And then a condensed range is a range that is like similar to the linear one, but it's mainly medium strength heavy with like very few weak and very few nutted hands. So if you want an idea of like what a condensed range would look like, it's maybe like a small blind cold calling range versus a button. So imagine if let's say in position opens and you call the small blind, you're going to fold your band hands because you don't want to fold, call them, they can't call profitably. You're going to three better good hands, you know, like your like jacks, queens, kings, aces, ace, kings, ace, queens. Then you're going to call mainly hands like say like pocket pairs, connectors, like shooting broadways, some of the broadways maybe like that depending on the RFI position, but like good, decent, but not necessarily like amazing hands and not bad hands. So there's also the gap range, as we know. So the gap range is a range that likes the strongest hand available, depending on texture. Uh, so, and then an uncapped range is a range that contains the strongest hand available, depending on texture. So we can have, I mean, a polarized range is by definition uncapped because it would always contain the nutted hands. Otherwise, it's not polarized. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, uh, but you can have a, a linear range that is capped. You can have a condensed range that is capped or uncapped. Right? And then depending on how capped or uncapped a range is, because that's what's going to happen, you know, in real world scenarios, you like you have to build your river strategy and your bet size strategy. Okay, because again, in reality, ranges are always a little bit of a spectrum between linear and polar, and <laughs> Your idea is you get to be more aggressive when you have a polar range against a capped range that's linear or condensed. Okay. Now, but the more they trap, the more they have strong hands that can potentially tie or beat our value bets, the more conservative we have to be. So we can't really bet super often. We can't really use huge bet sizes. Now, if they don't have those good hands, if they are like, if they are capped, Rather, we can be aggressive, we can use big bets, we can value bet a little bit thinly because we are like we are at a bigger overall, like not advantage. Again, range advantage, not advantage are two, you know, conflicting ideas. You have to remember that range advantage is like important in general, but on the river, not advantage is a little bit more important. Oh, uh, yeah, this is a river spot where. Like we are, we have a very simplified situation where uh, in position has a polarized range and out of position has a like linear range, if you will, has a rather condensed range. And we are on the river. The board is basically like six five five six nine, so it's like relatively bricky. Uh, out of position has only tens and jacks. In position has Kings, queens, pocket threes, and pocket twos. Okay. So the pot is 100. The effective stack is 1,000. So the SPR is 10x. So can you guys guess what the solver's bet sizing choice will be for in position? And will out of position do any leading here? Again, out of position has. Jacks and tens in position has kings, queens, threes, and twos. So, how this has only. Yep. Yeah, I think this is like this is the beginning, so it's fairly easy to navigate. So, out of position never donks because these are pure bluff cutters in a sense. They lose to bangle, they beat bluffs, and in position goes all in with. All the value, there's no other sizing, even though I gave it seven different options. Mm -hmm. And bluffs, right? And why are we not always bluffing pocket twos and pocket threes? So here we have exactly the same number of value combos and bluff combos and potential bluff combos. But we are always value betting, naturally, but we're not always bluffing. So we are giving up a portion, about 10% of our pocket twos and our pocket threes. 
Ja, zeg maar, all the time, you should always call it, yeah, right. Because then our bluff to white ratio is un- unbalanced to both bluffs for, like, the bad side. Now, of course, what I could do is I could increase the SPR and say that now the effective stack is 100,000. So 100x. Now what you see is, now we're actually, like, only taking back 0.5% of the time. So now we're bluffing. Like we're value betting 50% of the time and we are bluffing 49.5% of the time. Why? Because we make the pot bigger, right? Uh, we can make the pot a lot bigger with a 100x pot behind rather than 10x pot behind. So for that same bet size, we get to have more bluffs. Now, if, the, if, if I make it like a million x, it will always. Like it will always reduce the second frequency. The bet size will always go. They will always be like all in, but we will never bluff a hundred percent of our pocket twos and pocket threes. We will bluff ninety five as before, ninety nine point five as now, ninety nine point nine 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 nine. But no matter how, like you know how deep the SPR, we will never bluff a hundred percent of our pocket twos and pocket threes. Okay, because we can we like. We always, regardless of bed size, need to bluff like less than 50% of the time, even if it's a tiny bit less. Okay, so let me go back to the let's let's go the opposite. Obviously, if we make the effective stacks like one export, then what will happen is we will bluff a lot less. So now our boost can still always six. And now we have a spot where our maximum bed size is bot. So we're betting pot. Know, with our 12 value combos, and then because we only get to bluff a third of the time for pot, we only have six bluffs. So we're bluffing pocket twos and pocket threes half the time. It's, blocked, it's bluffing these uh, like 50-50 because like they don't have any relevant blockers or unblockers, and, uh, and they don't really matter in the sense like if you bluffed twos all the time and threes never, it would be the same. Uh, the same if you, if you wouldn't change. But let's say we remove. We go to our range and we remove pocket twos. So now we only have like uh, our value combos, our bluffs. We have pocket twos as a bluff, pocket threes as a bluff, kings and queens for value, and our opponent still has bluff cut. Okay, so the SPR is still the same. So 10 export, let's run it and see what happens. So what do you guys think happens? Our question always falls. Well, but is that the way to maximize our V? If we're in position, we still want to make them indifferent. Like that's the way we maximize V any time. We want to find the largest available bed size that makes them indifferent. But now we don't have enough bluffs, right? So what are we gonna do? Again, they don't donk which is to be expected for the same reasons as before. Now, if we check, you can see that the solver is actually using all of the pocket threes as bluffs, but it's not always betting all in. So it's mixing every bet size to keep our, our opponents indifferent. So now I think the math of bet sizing is like a little bit beyond the scope of this session, but you can see that like, I mean, if I if I gave this like few fewer bed sizing options, it would be a little bit easier to to follow. So to give you like a very simple idea, let's say that we only have in position you can bet like pots, you know, like uh, 2.5 exports and in. You can see that it will distribute, uh, you know, our value bets and our bluffs. It doesn't really matter what we have, right? And it doesn't matter because all of our value bets are like the nuts and all of our bluffs lose to everything and don't really block or unblock any, any part of the calling range uh, in a way that allows us like to put our opponent in, in a spot of indifference. Yeah, but the bet sizing will change. That's the idea. And that's the exception we talked about. So it's not going to be like common, but sometimes like one player, because of prior action, because of you know like pre-flop, because of flop and turn action, will not have enough bluffs. Naturally, so when that's the case, that's the that's one of the exceptions where you need to size down. <laughs>